Me too. All right. All right. Frank, how are you? I'm doing well, guys. Thanks for having me in here. I really appreciate it. I've Thank you for a while. Yeah. So we didn't oh. think you would like us after a while. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. We don't have to, yeah, we don't have to tell that story, but you know. That's but, fine. Yeah. Didn't plan on it. Yeah. But anyway, so so we'll just start this off. So I'm Pete and this is Julie. And, Hello. Great to see you guys again. It's been a while since I've been out there with y'all. Yes. Yeah. So tonight we have Frank and we know Frank from work. So Frank is recently retired and he has quite an interesting career. So where he started, the people that he met and stuff like that. So Julie, you got anything? Uh, no, I mean, I was just going to say Frank Barolo was at my station when I first got there as a medic, but I was very new. And then you became a lieutenant soon after, I think. Um, uh, that's about right. I think I might have got off the bus just a couple months before you came there. Yeah. And if I'm not incorrect, you might have spent quite a few times uh, on the bus as an intern with my old partner, Ann Sale. Yes, I love Ann. <laughs> oh, so do I. Me and worked together for over 10 years. And, you know, we got to the point where we were like left brain, right brain, you know, just working together. And we had a running joke back in the day. People used to say, man, you guys work together so great. You know, how the hell do you do that? Well, we've been working together longer than all of our marriages combined. I <laughs> She's at four. So that tells you how long we've been working together. <laughs> So funny, but when you have a good partner, you know, things just mm -hmm. kind of flow. And that's, that's a nice thing about, you know, this job when you've been on for a while. Because in the beginning, you sort of just get passed around a bit. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I know, like a big fat joint. But what you said, <laughs> yep. is correct. When you work with someone, you know, you, you really, and, and that's kind of the way it was with Anne. It was a bittersweet kind of way for me yeah. to leave. Uh, I, I'd gotten so close and fond of our working relationship that, and, and our friendship, of course, which has really been fantastic over the years. And, you know, leaving that was making the promotion kind of the one of the hardest decisions of my life. That and Bruce Hydock was our third. Yeah. So you can imagine what a crew that was, you know, yeah. between yeah. Dream team. me. That was some serious personalities going on there. We were so different, but, you know, it all worked. Yeah. It worked, and I yeah. missed that. But... I think becoming a ball salter, it was a good decision for me. You know, I made some new friends. Yo, I couldn't imagine being BLS and having them back you up and you calling them for some dumb shit. Um, <laughs> Could you imagine? Dude, I was that I was that dumb shit guy back in the day too. I started BLS there also, man. I was oh it man. Was just going through the ranks and going through the years with me too. You know, I mean, I, mm. I think we've all seen kind of the same things over the years. We've experienced the same kind of growing pains and yeah. At the end of the day, it works out pretty good, and, and I'm, yeah. I'm thrilled to, uh, to have been able to do that for 30 years. You know, really, it was really a, a good cool. career. Time. 30 years, yep. 30 years, mm -hmm. that's a long time. So, yeah. we're not going to date you. What but year did you, uh, yeah, what year did, um, you, what year did you go to EMT class? I, I started my EMT class when I was, uh, when I was 20 years old, and I, I took it on the outside. Um, okay. Uh, Staten Island EMT. My my instructor's name was Willie Wright back in the day. I don't know. You guys might have heard of him. He's pretty notorious out on the island. Good guy. Uh, and I was actually how I got here is is interesting. I was originally going to be a teacher, a graphic arts teacher. I was in the printing industry, going to college, uh, working part time in the printing industry as well. Okay. And uh, the whole college thing, you know, college just doesn't work for everybody. Mm -mm. And it didn't work for me. I was a young uh, 18, 19 year old guy in college back then. And, and, and I, I grew up in a very kind of sheltered environment and I wanted to get out there and live a little bit and defy my mm -hmm. parents as we all kind of do. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I did great in all my major classes, but the academics were always a pain in the ass for me. And I subsequently I left everybody. College. It does. Everybody that ends up here. It does. Yeah. I left college, went to work full time in the printing industry and shortly therein, wound up getting into an EMT class uh, one way or the other, uh, which I had fantasized about when I was a little kid and just, you know, opportunity came knocking on my door one day uh, when I was miserable about, miserable about leaving college and uh, saw this ambulance come whipping by where I was hanging out, feeling sorry for myself. Yeah. As fate would have it on that day, I got home, 
my dad opens up the Staten Island Advance, which is our local newspaper out here. Yeah. And it says there's a, uh, I've already made the phone call. There's an EMT class starting uh, next month and they have a seat for you if you're interested in that. Oh. And I said, hell yeah, let's do this. And uh, while I was still in the EMT class, I continued to work full time in the uh, in the printing industry. I was running press, okay. and, uh, doing photography work, all that kind of stuff. Hmm. And, uh, and this is the old stuff, right? With like the plates that like you had to set the plates exactly. on there and like screw the plates on. And... Not only was I screwing plates on, there were certain aspects where I was actually using hand type and composing it by hand. Wow. For press that actually is a press. Like you see the oh. old. Yeah. The old, the old Gutenbergs and stuff that uh, Ben Franklin used actually Clayton presses wow. that actually press mm -hmm. one piece of paper in there. We yeah. learned that it's pretty much like nostalgia, but there is still a lot of applications okay. that still yeah. used. And I yeah. learned all I could never go back in that industry now. I'd be completely mm. a dinosaur. Everything's mm. best publishing mm. now. Yo, but that's what the hipsters are doing. I was just watching this guy. It's like the Sac it's Sacramento Historical Society. And the guy does like all this like set type print stuff. Mm -hmm. And he's like doing all this old print and it's all coming back again. So wow. all the uh, stuff that we forgot about. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I, I mean, I really haven't thought about that in a long time. I, I actually haven't thought about my previous career until I talked to you guys, and you know, we started talking mm -hmm. about what was going to come up to this day. So uh, that made me think back a lot, and it was a lot of good memories. I had a lot of fun getting yeah. there, but yeah, but, yeah I'm, I'm so glad that my career path didn't wind up going the way that it went. Yeah, it would be different. You know what I mean, Mike? But now you have something. You know, you're not as scared. Like when you leave. You, know, you kind of have something, all right, I kind of had a career before this, right. you know? So I think that's the scariest thing is like, when you finally leave, like, what are you going to do? You know? So, the change was tough, but it kind of felt natural, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and ultimately today I wound up, you know, getting to do both my passions, which was not only doing EMS work, but uh, there wound up to be a good amount of teaching and instructing back around yeah. at the part of that game, which I was happy for. Yeah. Okay. Which is nice. You know, it's like you kind of come back to what you liked and what you were hoping to do in the first place. Yeah. You know? yeah. It turned out I was good at two things. I got to do both of them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, pretty good. Frank, when you, you did this class at around 20 years old, what did you do when you became an EMT? Like, did you do volunteer stuff? Did you like get a job right away? I did. Uh, shortly after, my dad was smart. My dad's a retired teacher. That's then he was a civil servant. That's kind of where I got, you know, my okay. initial passion to think I was going to be a teacher. I did like it. I okay. did enjoy it. I was kind of gifted in public speaking before I even came into all of this. And okay. so it was kind of a logical fit. Hey, let's see where this goes. But um, to get back to it. I think yeah. Staten Island guys just like to talk because Kira, she's from Staten Island. And she oh, we don't like to talk. That. And being Italian also. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you guys know each other. Everybody knows everybody on Staten Island. You'd be surprised. Yeah, yeah it is certainly a small island. It certainly mm -hmm. is. But uh, mm -hmm. right after EMT class, as soon as I got that card in my hand, Dad took me up to 40 Worth Street, where the civil service office was back in the day in Manhattan. Okay. And applied for civil service EMS that day. I was fortunate. I mean, right after I got out of the academy, I was no longer provisional. I was civil service. And I know it's, mm. it's different now that once you get in there, you're already civil service. It wasn't like that back in the day. You came out provisional. <laughs> but my dad, thankfully, mm. had that foresight to get me down there and sign up with him. It was a pretty slick move. Yeah. And right mm. after that, I hired by a private ambulance company. I worked there for about a year while I was waiting to get called by EMS before I got into my top class. And okay. my original top class was 9205. Wow. Yep. 9205. Uh, uh, what, what ambulance company did you work for? It's defunct now, but uh, it was called Dell Ambulance. And uh, they had a sister company working out of the same garage, which is Metro One, which if they didn't have a partner for me at Dell, they flopped me on one of those buses for the day. And we did that. Okay. And we did the run-of-the-mill stuff, you know, dialysis, transport, right. clinics, discharges, stuff like that. Once in a while, we got thrown a bone. We got something where we could flip the lights and siren on. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, let's face it. Right. Half the fun is getting there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is half the fun. How was the equipment when you worked there? Primitive. Was it <laughs> primitive? Primitive. Oh, my yeah. suction unit. We didn't even have an electric suction unit. Oh. We had something cool. We had a foot What was it? Sorry. 
It was called a VVAC. It was a little handheld device where you actually, by hand, it had a little canister and a sort of a French chip catheter on the end of it. And it had a handle. That container, it was an accordion-like container. And when you pulled the trigger on, on this device, it generated, man, it generated manual suction, got the job done, and you threw away that accordion-shaped container. But you were actually generating okay. this stuff by hand back then. I feel like they might have that. Yeah, they, they might have the same thing now, but it was. Yeah. I think yeah. I think I've seen it, but I mean I've never used it. Right. Um, so I, like at BOT, I know they have a lot of the older equipment and stuff. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's in there. I don't know. Stuff that I came on the truck with is probably in the EMS museum. <laughs> and that place, you know, an antique just like me. <laughs> but it's cool to and see so, a lot of stuff, you know. Yeah, that I love like, that old stuff, you know. And like what you guys like didn't have compared to like what we have now, you know, it's just, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's totally different now. I mean, just to give you an idea, our, uh, our first SAEDs, our first uh, semi-automatic defibrillators uh, were literally the size of a life pack 10 back in the day. And they weighed about yeah. 25 pounds. Oh. And, uh, and you had not, to carry it. Not everybody was defibrillator certified. You didn't have to be back then. Huh. But that thing was ridiculous. It was like a brick. It was literally a a a, a, a valise, yeah. a briefcase sized device. And and now I mean, yeah. they're an iPad now. Yeah, it's so crazy, right? It's, like the stuff yep. you brought in. And you had to carry that upstairs, right? On every job. We had to hump that upstairs on every job where we thought cardiac might be involved. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And maybe I got the opportunity to use them about five or six times throughout the five years that I was BLS. We had some. We had some pretty hot shit ALS guys back in the day. And uh, if if uh, if they screamed, we came running. If we screamed, they came running. It was a pretty good symbiotic relationship back in the old days. Yeah, that's pretty cool. What did you yeah. think about, you know, like EMS when you were on the when you were on the transport side? Did you guys like look up to them? We certainly did, you know, and, you know, I always had the aspiration of getting there someday. Okay. And most of the people I met at that, they were all pretty cool. And, and you'd be surprised how many of us more started in that transport arena than, than did not. So, yeah. um, you know, I never felt any negativity from any of them or anything like that. It was, it was actually kind of a good positive learning experience when, when the time came. And we did have to call, you know, uh, for, uh, for city, for municipal backup occasionally. We didn't have any medics running around with us. Okay. Uh, they did have medics employed by the company, but they were kind of like on-call people. If they had a higher risk okay. that needed medics, that's when they came out. But other than that, you know, we really had no interaction with ALS unless we had a call okay. from uh, back then. It was Health and Hospital Corporation. We weren't even working for the fire department back then. Okay. Green and white. Now, <laughs> yeah. Green and, and so were there voluntary paramedic units with HHC units? There were voluntary HHC, especially, you know, most of my company on the Dell side, like I said, it was a two-fold company. Yeah. Uh, the Metro one side did all of Brooklyn and wherever else their transports might have taken okay. them to. And Dell concentrated mostly on Staten Island. And we did have uh, a good couple of medic units from Staten Island University Hospital, which we call 6-2 and 5-9. And... Uh, Okay. Also, what was St. Vincent's Hospital back in the day, which is now Richmond University Medical Center, they had a couple of medics as well. And we did get okay. the opportunity to interact with those guys quite occasionally. And it was it was it was cool. It was refreshing. Yeah. Hmm. You know, one thing that I'm lucky that, you know, they, they teach all paramedics is, you know, you're pretty much the medical authority wherever you go out there. And, you know, let, let's let, let's not be condescending. If you can see a teachable moment for someone, please make it a teachable mm -hmm. moment, you know. Yeah. Don't make mm -hmm. the guy feel like an asshole. He just doesn't know some yeah. teacher about it. And you know what? Next time he might recognize this and he'll be a better clinician for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I honestly, yeah. I feel like I have uh, memories of when I was an NT and like some medic yelling at me. And um, it was a bummer because I didn't really know why he was yelling at me. Like it was, you know, I, 
I called for a patient who had like, you know, adventitious lung sounds and they had lung cancer, but it was like, they weren't breathing well. It was kind of like a respiratory difficulty kind of deal. And I got a little nervous. I was like a new EMT and I called for medics. And when they came, it was FDNY medics. And like, he was really annoyed. Like he was kind of like, yeah, no shit. Like his lungs sound bad, you know? And, um, he didn't, I don't think they came with us, like they 94 it or whatever, but mm-hmm. I didn't really understand why, you know, at the time, like he never mentioned anything, but I had other great ALS backup when I was BLS that would say, I remember I worked upstate for a, an IFT kind of thing, but we also did 911. Mm-hmm. So they, the medics that I worked with gave labetalol for like a hypertensive. And so my first job that I called for a hypertensive patient And the medics came and he was super nice. You know, he was like, we don't treat this, you know, like not, not, you know, here, but I get why you called. And, you know, so I had like some really great medics that like would like to teach us. Um, And, but I can remember the one where I got yelled at, you know, it was like very embarrassing and like kind of crummy because you're like, I don't really know what I did wrong. Uh, I try to. Sometimes I I, I know what you're saying. But yeah, so I, I don't know. I try, sometimes it's hard, you know, like sometimes you, you're Sometimes kind of, it's warranted though. You know, sometimes you have to. There are folks who've been on for a long enough time that sometimes it's a surprise when they like-, you're like um, Those are the ones that I really get surprised about. That's yeah. the ones that really hurt my heart. So when you know them for a long time and they do some wild stuff and it's like, so that's why go Frank out of us. He's like, these guys have been around for a long time. Then he did that. Yeah. He's, and he was thinking, he's like, he's like hey. yeah, I got to call my friend Neil. I'll tell you, the only reason I ever did stuff like that in my career, um, when I really had to kind of pound somebody, is, is, is if I've seen or noticed, you know, a potential that a crew member can get really hurt. Or, yeah. you know, I've seen a lot of that stuff before I've went through it. I've, I've had crew members in front of me getting hurt when, when, when it could have been avoided. And, you know, if you see an opportunity to potentially kind of stop something stupid from happening, you know, you jump in and you do it. And, and I find that, you know, the best way to do that is, again, you know, with education. And mm-hmm. um, the, calling Neil was, was just reinforcement for my case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, it worked. Don't was, worry, it worked. Well, it was, I'm, I'm <laughs> glad it did, you know what? And, and I'm glad, you know, it, it ultimately led us to this moment. It yeah. did, where, it definitely did. We have a big understanding about it. Yeah. Yes, you Julie, definitely can. I, I just circle, if it's okay, if, can I circle back to something you said a couple minutes ago, you know, with, you know, oh, how you would with, uh, with medics that kind of appear to be a little bit condescending towards EMTs. I've encountered that a couple of times in my career also when I was an EMT, you know, you get the medics coming up to you. Sometimes we get cocky, you know, yeah, we're pretty sharp. The city does train some of the best of them, but you know what? I mean, you really can't let, let it get to you, your head. Um, has it gone to my head once or twice over the years? Yeah, I will. And have I been regretful about it? Absolutely true. But um, I, I find that if you just talk to the EMTs and, you know, you share the knowledge and you kind of give them a little bit of why, because, you know, they know somehow that, you know, the stuff that we carry around in our magic bag works, mm-hmm. but a lot of times they really don't understand why it works. And when you kind of explain mm-hmm. it to them and say, well, listen, this is why we can't do anything about this particular situation. I appreciate you calling us and I'm glad we had the opportunity to talk about it. And this is the kind of situation where that stuff in our magic bag would work. And this is why, this is how it happens. That not only puts them at ease and makes them not feel so silly for calling for ALS backup in the future. It's also can be kind of inspiring to some EMTs to say, Hey, you know what? I'd like to have a damn magic bag like that myself. Yeah. one day." Yeah. And yeah. that's exactly what happened to me. You know, one of the people that, it, that, that really inspired me the most is I know you guys remember this name because I know he's still out there, but Gary Simmons. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gary was uh, somebody that inspired yeah. me the most. He was a medic. When I came on a job in 92, he was a brand new medic, brand new. Wow. Medic. And so he's looking at about 36, 37 years wow. right now. He's yeah. still plugging away as ALS coordinator. He's still plugging away from what yeah. I know. Yeah. But uh, guys like him uh, uh, and uh, Captain Cuevas, who's, is he a chief now? I don't know, but he's up in communications. He was one of the best street medics I ever knew. Uh, there's been so many influences over mm-hmm. the years. And, and I've, I've been lucky enough to interact with enough of the medics that were willing to give you that little bit of education, 
willing to sit down and talk to you about the things that, okay, what'd you do right? What'd you do wrong? Um, mm-hmm. Do you need to call me for this in the future? Mm, probably not, you know, but yeah. And, and bed was busy as hell back in the early nineties, you know, yeah. and for to sit down and, and, and explain to us what's going on. It was, it was kind of nice. It was flattering. It really kind of yeah. motivated me. As soon as I was at that uh, medic screening, damn, I jumped on that. I jumped on that hard. And uh, yeah. I'm going to date myself again. My medic class was FD Medic Basic 1. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. Uh, I mean, no, I like mm. that's mm. Med Basic 1. I wonder. Because what's his name? What else? It, there's another guy that we talked to. Um, Mark, you know Mark. For, he does the Coney Island EMS thing. Oh, wow. Uh, Mark, Mark. What's his last name? Oh my God, why is it slipping me right now? Um, yeah, he is the best person. He knows all about the Coney Island EMS kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but who, so Medic Basic 1, that was fire department, like, put you guys through. That was the fire department's first right. medic after they took us over in, in, uh, in late 96. And mm-hmm. they threw a medic class together really, really quick. You know, they already had the capacity to do it. They already had the knowledge, know yeah. how to F up the academy. And mm-hmm. relatively quick, uh, our class went in in, I'm going to say it was October or November of 97. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah, that was Medic Basic. Well, actually, no, it had to be earlier than that because we, we graduated in 97. We were there for oh, a good what portion of the year 97, but yeah, we did graduate in 97. Huh. I was in high school in 97. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, all right, I, so when you went to top class, so hold on, wait, let's back up real quick. So you went sure. to top class. Mm-hmm. How bad was top class when you went through? Top class, I mean, it, it wasn't, you know, I already had, a, you know, I got to imagine it was certainly easier than for cadets going through. Um, as far as the academia goes, it wasn't that bad. You know, I, I wasn't, uh, okay. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like saying like, hey, I can whip through this without opening up a damn book. Yeah. Because I did study, you know, yeah. I, did study, I did my thing and, you uh, I did appreciate that I got some cooler and more interesting training than just getting the EMT class on the outside. You know, there was, yeah, some- I, yeah. And it was pretty cool. And one of the, one of the hardest pain in the ass things was EVOC because uh, when we did EVOC, back, it was on, it was on Floyd Bennett field in Brooklyn oh. and I was in there in December. Ugh, oh my God. It, that, Floyd Bennett Field, it was like 20 degrees out, you know, it was horrendous. I'm sure. So wait, so we have to set it up for people who don't know. So Fort Totten is in Queens. Right. And it's on the end of Queens at the end of the Long Island Sound. Right. And it was originally an army base and it, it just funnels all the wind to it. Yeah, Floyd Bennett Field is like even worse. It's even worse. Yes. It's even worse. That's like you know, that, was, that was like Fort Totten times 10. And it was completely yeah, so wide open. There were, no buildings, there were no trees. It, it was, was like an airport, right? Don't they have like mm-hmm. planes fly into there or something? It right? is. Floyd Bennett yeah. Field used, yeah. to be an, mm-hmm. used to be an active airfield. You know, a lot of the hangars yeah. are still there, of which PD Aviation occupies now. So yeah. it's like, yeah, it's just like land, nothing it's else. It's land. Nothing, yeah. like Nothing to block the wind from you except the buddy standing next to you. Huh. Yeah. Wait, so they made you stand outside. So wait, so let's go over this. So I know at EVOC, when I did it, you had a nice, I did it in the summer too. So it was just hot. We just complained about being hot. Yeah. And we had a phone booth. We had like a bus thing to stand yeah, in. Yeah, that's new. That they didn't have, no, yeah, they we didn't have that bus. We, didn't, oh, we didn't have no bus uh, shelter. Yeah, now they had to wear a vest. There was heat lamps in it. No, we didn't have no. that one I went through. Yeah. And, and we had safety vests too. Oh, yeah. We, so yeah, so we, we had the cones, you know, in the, in the, in the little parking lot and stuff. So, we didn't have safety you know, vests. You know, we had, we had a 10 foot by 10 foot box <laughs> spray painted on the asphalt, which was our safety zone to stand in while the course oh. was in. Oh my God. We didn't have no bus shelter. If we were lucky, they let us crawl inside. They had one of the, uh, they had a, they had a, a, a school bus. Uh, it was like, you know, one of the, inf- one of the first, um, one of the first inceptions of the Bob, the big oxygen bus yeah. that we got, you okay. know, through, whatever the hell you, <laughs> I forget yeah yeah um, they, they all confuse me all those numbers and that didn't have any heat in it either it was just something to get out of the wind you know it was still cold as ass in there but at least yeah. you know we were able to get out of the wind but how, uh, do you, 
how'd you get there? Did they bus you there or you had to get there on your own? No, Joe, when we were, when we were uh, spending our week at EVOC, um, we, we drove there ourselves, they didn't shuttle us there. You know, now at the academy, it's kind of convenient. You know, you're there and EVOC's yeah. there, that, that's great. But mm. uh, those days, you know, we had to get ourselves there to Floyd Bennett Field. I had a partner um, that I had worked with in, in when I worked for uh, Dell Ambulance in the privates that we both got into the same top class coincidentally we were both hired at the same time and he lived in staten island also okay, and we called okay. every day for those uh however many months top class was back then and i want to say it was how much was the bridge back then yeah how much was it oh how much how much was it well i can tell you when i graduated medic school it was five bucks and that was 97. Wow. When I when I was going to top class, I want to say maybe it was two fifty three, four bucks at the most. But five years later, wow. it was, and now fast forward thirty years, if you don't got any, it's twenty bucks. Oh, it's twenty now. Yeah, it's twenty bucks. Ooh. Thank God for the Staten Island resident. Thanks, guys. Yeah. yeah, I get. Yeah. That's yeah. That's about maybe. Mm. That's about maybe four and change for me to get over that with the discount. Thank God. Yeah. Frank, when All you right, so Eva. I have a question too. Like when I did it was not part of like I did top class and then I, Mm -hmm. they put us out on the street and then for six months I wasn't allowed to drive. And then they brought us back for EVOC. Did you guys have that also? Or you got EVOC? Um, We got EVOC. It was, uh, we had, we had time. What they did was they they separated our classes up into, uh, into four platoons. And, you know, we, when, when one of the platoons was out, the rest of the class will be concentrating on skills, skills proficiency, okay. getting, you know, getting your state, uh, uh, getting your state skills approvals and all that stuff. But we had it right during the top class. If you needed to go back, there were some times where they would send you out, not EVOC, and then you would have to go in for REVOC. You know? uh-huh. okay. But it was pretty, it was pretty rare. But for the most part, okay. you know, we usually get at least 85, 90% of the class through during the academy. And, and it's funny, man, I, I came out and literally like day three, I'm out there driving with another guy that just graduated a month before me. God. And there was no mentorship program back then. You know, they had it for medics because you had to get your, back then it was something like, uh, I don't know, you had to get like 860 hours of mentorship before you were senior medic, which actually was almost six months of working, you know, six, eight months of working. Okay. Work back then. We worked only eleven hundred and twenty hours a year. Now we're up at like thirteen hundred with the twelve-hour tours. Yeah, but literally, it took you six to eight months to get your senior medic status back then. Okay. Uh, when you came out as an EMT, man, they just they just threw your ass right out there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, literally, I'm working hmm. out there with a guy that got out a few weeks before me, or in a couple of cases, I worked with people that I graduated with the same class from. You know, I had to go pick up a partner. I was VR. They didn't have the whole mentorship thing. You just got scaled yeah. out. Probably wanted to send you. And when you got enough seniority to get on a bus, where there was a spot for you on a bus, then you got a little bit of a little bit of normalcy, a little bit of everyday cohesiveness that, you know, okay, I'm not gonna be getting bounced around all over the place anymore. Wow. It took a while back in the day, you know, that the mentorship is really a good thing. And I'm glad they're doing it now because I tell you, I felt when I originally came out that. Holy shit! They're just they're just they're just throwing me right into the frying pan out here, and that's mm-hmm. what it was like. My first day was was on the day. Do you remember your first call? My first day was on the day of a hurricane. There was a hurricane that came through in 1992. I got out. I want to say um, so. I started 10-5-92, and I got out mid to late December. So the top class now I'm remembering and, and talking more was, was actually about okay. two months. Whereas the, the cadet okay. class is about maybe four or five months because they have to teach you to be an EMT for jump. But I got out there just before, the, just before or right after the holidays. And there was a hurricane that came up and through. And that was my first day of work. Oh my God. Wow. During, in tropical storm and it was just nuts and of course i got mandated on my first day of work yes of course i worked mm-hmm. double that day because you know half the next mm-hmm. tour, half the four three all called in because oh crap it's raining you know yeah. oh no mm-hmm. it was a damn hurricane wow mm-hmm. so back in the day so 
originally when you when we started, we had three tours, right? Mm-hmm. So when you came on, you, you guys had the three tours. So you right. had tour one, which is the overnight shift. Right. So midnight to eight in the morning generally. And then mm-hmm. tour two, which is a day shift, which is like seven to three or you know, four to you know, you know what I'm saying. And then the mm-hmm. mid the afternoons, which is tour three. Right. So when you came out, you went on which tour where did they send you? I came out and I was uh, I was tour two. Okay. And I wound up having the worst commuting portion of tour two ever. Uh, uh, hmm. I came out, uh, my report time was pretty much between nine o'clock and 10 o'clock in the morning, depending upon where they wanted to stick me. So I'm dealing with rush hour on the way in from Staten Island at bed which literally could take me. I mean, I can't really bitch much now because back then it took me about an hour to get into work, hour and a half. Now, when you're dealing with that portion of the BQ with the Gowanus and all that stuff, that could be mm-hmm. closer to hours on any given day. Yeah. No? It's yeah. horrendous. Yeah. And I worked tour two, to be quite honest with you, my entire career until I got promoted to lieutenant. Oh, wow. Hmm. Uh, my hours did get better at some point. All of my BLS hours was, 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 was literally five years of dealing with white knuckle traffic every day. Yeah. Wow. My first uh, four three or four years of being in ALS, I was working even worse. Uh, when they first started 5-7 Willie, that was uh, that was 10 in the morning till six at night, six at night till two in the morning. That was the two tours that 5-7 Willie ran back then. And I was on 5-7 Willie too. And again, just getting out of medical school, I had just mm-hmm. moved in with my wife. We were boyfriend and girlfriend at that time. What a great way to start yeah. a relationship with her and trying to integrate in her family. She has two kids before me and, and uh, yeah, I'd love to have dinner with Shilton tonight, but my ass ain't gonna be home till 8 p.m. <laughs> you know, yeah. and to their credit, most of the time they waited for me, which was which was yeah. nice. They waited for me, mm. but uh, mm. once I became a boss, again, you know, all of my seniority gone, gone. Yeah. I wound up being the uh, the second highest. Uh, I'm sorry, the third highest ranking medic in the station behind Gary Simmons and Ann Sale. Oh. And there was Frank. And so pretty much, you know, I had to pick a litter at that point. Yeah. And we, we got to some more normal stuff, you know, where we were working six in the morning to two in the afternoon, which okay. meant it, it, it reduced my commute by half. Thank God for that. Yeah. How it, it's amazing what an hour will do. You know what I mean? Either know, way. It's amazing. And, and especially when you did all the overtime that we have to do to make a living, mm-hmm. you can actually go home and, and that extra hour or two that you can yeah. get in the rack yeah. yeah, you need it yeah. so much. You really need it yeah. so much. Because back then, yeah. I mean, I was busting out three doubles a week, and I did that pretty much my entire career. You know, just mm-hmm. trying to make it work. Mm-hmm. I wasn't so happy when you came in. Part-time. When you came in as an EMT, the mm-hmm. mandates were just as bad, right? The mandates were just as bad. They were. I mean, let's. So we didn't have nearly as many people on the job back then. You know, now we're we're. Okay. we're about we're at about 4,500 to 5,000 right now as far as personnel. Back then, we were mm-hmm. we were about 3,200 back then, you know, maybe even less, maybe under 3,000. Mm-hmm. We had so fewer stations. And coal okay. volume was also a lot lower back then. Yeah. The population came up over the last 30 years in the city. The coal volume has just went nuts. And uh, thankfully, the city responded and, and started funding more lines to get some more people out there. And, and it did make it yeah. a little bit it did make it a little bit. So there was a lot of like voluntary units too, right? And like volunteer ambulances back then? There were volunteer trucks, uh, as, as we call them, you know, pure volunteers. Yeah. Uh, and I know, you know, uh, a lot of people sometimes get confused with what we call voluntary and what volunteers are. So of course yeah. there's voluntary unpaid folks that, that work for an ambulance corps that just do this out of the love of their heart that, you know, they're inspired yeah. by work and do it. And we, of course, have our voluntary ambulances which are subcontracted through the system and respond to 911 calls. They get the same equipment we get, KDTs, radios, GPS, yeah. things that we enjoy on our trucks to help us make our lives and jobs a little bit easier. Yeah. There were considerably, I want to say there were more voluntaries. And again, mm-hmm. these are people coming from the hospitals that are subcontracted yeah. 911 system. Yep. Yeah. And I've kind of seen over the years that, you know, a lot of those voluntary systems kind of got it's faked. Gone away. They mm-hmm. got faked. Uh, 
uh, St. Mary's in Brooklyn being an example. Uh, when that hospital started going south, the fire department, bam, jumped in and took over the three medic units that came out of there. And mm -hmm. wound up being the units that ran out of my station, I served that for when I was a supervisor at 38, which is right next to Kings County Hospital. Uh, they took over okay. those trucks, and that's where that came from. Okay. So okay. the city, for the most part, it was kind of an interesting evolution. Um, mm -hmm. You can bill a lot more running an ALS truck than you can run in a BLS truck, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you got a higher skill set coming on board, we're giving medications, we're dropping 12 leads, doing all sorts of fancy ass crap. So the city was more inclined to grant certificates of need for BLS units than ALS units. They wanted to take over as many ALS units as possible. Back then. So if, uh, okay. if a hospital went under and someone else took it over, oh, so okay. you know, hospitals change names just like stadiums change names. Yeah. When a new sponsor comes in, yeah. every, everything's on its table and you got to start from jump again. Yeah. So when, for example, when, when St. Vincent's Hospital in Staten Island went under a McCain Richmond University Medical Center, they had a fire certificate of need and they're like well, i give you no als trucks we need them for money you guys can run as many bls as you want at the end of the day yes they didn't wind up granting them an als truck or two over the years but at the beginning they you were know, kind of stingy and they wanted to make their prowess that like, we're the big als provider in the city okay hmm. and i wonder if they also learned that too from you know like when transcare went out you know like how many units that they lost mm -hmm. so we didn't get it that bad where we are you know, compared to the guys in the Bronx, like they got it pretty bad. So. They took a little bit of a beating. Uh, yeah. Rams care over the years has went through many evolutions. Yeah. Many mm -hmm. evolutions. One of which my, my, my wife used to work for back in the day. She was, uh, we had met on the bus when I was BLS and she worked on a, on, on a private for metropolitan ambulance, which mm -hmm. is, uh, one of the evolutions mm -hmm. for the former owner of, of Transcare. That was one of his prior companies. He's actually went through about four or five DBA names over the years. And uh, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. when he went down, you know, the last kind of surviving piece of that enterprise was senior care. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. And that's it's, it's funny how they all change. You know, like if you've been in the game long enough, you know, it's funny because like the same stuff is like in New Jersey, you know, like certain right. companies have like changed hands. Mm -hmm. Like, yo, that guy used to work over here and that was working over there. So it's always cool. Right. You know? Yep. Mm -hmm. hey, they bounce around a little bit. Yeah. They certainly do. Yeah. Uh, hmm. So as you were BLS, how many, like how many jobs were you doing in a, in a regular day? We were pretty busy in, in bed, and, and what was bed style like? That's the other thing. Like, I can't imagine. Nothing you know? like it now. Nothing mm -hmm. like it. I got to tell you, with 100% certainty, hey, I mean, um, if you could just remind me, what years did the both you guys eat? So, you, so all right, Julianne, I know you got to Bad Style in about 97. No, I got there in... No, I'm sorry, right before I promoted. it. My bad. Yes. 2008. That's right. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Pete? What year did you get around there? Uh, Post-gentrification, 2012. Post-gentrification. 2013. 2013. You, yeah. you would not recognize it from way oh. back. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, a couple examples. Uh, so, you know, not only, I mean, yeah, uh, our station's in bed -Stuy, but, you know, we got Williamsburg, we got Bushwick, we got, uh, we got Greenpoint all right in the proximity, and, and, and those were all very, very different altogether. Uh, yeah. 92 mm -hmm. was, uh, was, was pre-Giuliani. Uh, Giuliani did a lot of cleanup over the years, you know. He cleaned up a lot of the red light district. He got tougher on even, even minor gun crimes and stuff like that, but... Yeah. When I first came out, I mean, there were at least five or six shootings a week to be had for each member out there. You know, I mean, now if we get a couple of good ones a month, and you know, I use the term "good" ones in the way that we know that yeah. term. Not that it's yeah. ever your thing that somebody gets shot, but you know, no. a little excitement in the doldrums of taking someone with a cold or a flu or a boo boo. <laughs> mm -hmm. We get something we can actually help you with. You know, exactly those kind of good jobs they happened a lot more frequently back then and they were very frequent and uh now as far as the the landscape and the whole gentrification thing williamsburg including north williamsburg was a shithole mm -hmm. was an absolute shithole uh none of the restaurants that are there now yeah uh, it wasn't considered prime real estate until <clears throat> 
until almost you know the turn of the century, then people started getting a little yeah. bit more in in, in 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 what it had to offer, which was at the moment you know pretty low property values, but a very yeah. close proximity to Manhattan. Yeah, you know you're a you're a ten minute subway ride from Midtown Manhattan, and then bam, your ass is at work. You hop on that double G train in Greenpoint, and boom, you're there. Or Williamsburg, same thing. You got two more stops, yeah. and Bed Stuy, an additional five six minutes on the M, and and you're there. Um, a lot of the homes, you know, they were all in disrepair. Uh, okay. Shit was falling apart. Landlords didn't care. You know, they were renting to as many people as they can, just filling their house up. They didn't give a crap what it looked like. Yeah. They started this influx of folks that said, hey, you know, this, this property's got some real innate value here. They started buying in. Uh, professional folks, you know, people who had a little bit of money to throw down. And, and I've seen a lot of uh, renovations in these houses and these brownstones, all these walk-ups that we hate because there's no elevator. We got to yeah. get out of and now all flights of stairs. Yeah. No fun. That's yeah. never a good day. I know. But, a lot but of I can imagine old- it back then, like, you know, the stairs and, you know, the house is in disrepair, oh, you yeah. know, back then compared to now. Like, no. I mean, know, the like- load I rate was, was pretty impressive back then, you know, just, yeah. I mean, and I'm not yeah. talking, you know, you know, the way load I is now. I'm talking, you yeah. know, legit, legit serious injuries back then because sure. people, not only, you know, were they dealing with these houses and disrepair, rickety staircases, we did, we just didn't even have really the equipment back then to keep us physically healthy that we do now. We didn't have the motorized stretchers, the stair yeah. chair with the, little, uh, with the little grippy things on them that go down the stairs. Yeah. We didn't have all that. Mm-hmm. Back then. It, was, it was manpower, and that's all it was. It was yeah. manpower. Yeah. And, like, I've heard, like, when you go in the projects, there was no lights in the stairwells, right? Quite a few of them there weren't, which is why back in the day, you know, the big thing was, you know, hey, my mag light is bigger than yours is. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. And when I first graduated the academy, my sister gave me a mag light. And she was like, I know you all you guys carry these things. And she's like, well, I guess, you know, maybe bigger is better. She gave me a 5D cell mag light that was almost <laughs> two feet long. Oh my God. I mean, it banged into my ankle when I was going up and down the stairs. Mm-hmm. Man, it was so long. You know, now I'm yeah. a fan. The one I can clip to my belt that's just as bright, if not brighter than that mag light, yeah. weighs half a pound. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. And it's not yeah. going to give black yeah. and blue on the back of my leg every day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then you turn it on and it's like dead after like one use. And you're yeah. like, you know, you're stingy <laughs> when you used it. You know, like, and now I can just find five pieces. SB thing in my truck and charge it up in 20 minutes and we're mm-hmm. going to go for another run. Yeah. 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 Wow. yeah. I, I sometimes think, I mean, now that I'm getting older, I guess it's, it is a good thing that things have changed a bit, but you know, when I got on, I was in my twenties and stuff. And like, we had the two man stretcher and I had two female partners. So there was like three women on one truck and none of us were over five, four, you know? And so to like hoist this thing up, we used to have these, like all these different ways that you do it. And like, we would always rest it on our thighs and then like shimmy around the side. So I had this perpetual like bruise on my leg that like never went away because I always rested the thing there. But I'm like, I felt like I was in good shape, you know, but I was also in my twenties and I'm like, now I'm in my forties. I don't know if uh, it would be as as wonderful and like helpful, but I feel like sometimes I'm like, oh, I was stronger then, you know, because we had to be like, we had to lift everybody up, you know, like deadlifting patients up into the ambulance and stuff, you know? Yep. And I do remember you from back in that day when you were that young. (laughs) I know. So and time has been time has been very good to you, Julia. Oh, so, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so how did yeah, how did what did you guys do when you had two man stretchers, you know, and you you know, like did you pull the stretcher as much? Well, you know, like, you know I mean we do we do we had to do. I mean, if I if I had a dude, you know, I mean I was I, I'm I'm not quite the in the same shape I was back in the day when I was yeah. on the bus. But, uh, I mean, if we could handle it, we handled it. It was a pain in the ass. You know, I mean, you had to lift that thing up from the floor. You had to load that stretch to the ground and, li- and dead lift that up from the floor. And when we, f- and, and literally that was for the first 10 or better, 10 or better years of my career into yeah. we one and a half man stretcher. And the first crew at my station to get the one and a half man stretcher was me and Ann because mm-hmm. and you know she had a shitty back I mean, she was she was a she was an old bag of bones she'd been on the job mm-hmm. yeah. 
on the job for quite Yeah, a but few. you know, when seniority has its perks. <laughs> Absolutely it does. And I was glad to be associated with it because I was only mm-hmm. a, a couple of years behind her, you know. So, you know, I'm like, oh shit, we're getting a new bus with the one and a half minute scratch and look at us, we're fancy, right? But that helped. Yeah. That yeah. certainly helped. But uh but what we had to do, you know, if we had something that we couldn't handle back in the day before the advent of all of that, you know, there's no shame in calling for that lift assist, you know. Yeah. That lift assist, keep that, you know, keep a mind on your body, keep an eye on your partner. Nobody wants yep. to get hurt. They call for no. that lift assist. That's yeah. what fire suppression is there for to help us out. Yeah. Yeah. And how was the equipment other than that? Like if you needed new stuff, you know, like Nancy's told us that you guys had to change your own tires and stuff like that. Back at the very beginning for the first few years, yes. If it was a front uh-huh. tire, we were expected to change it. Hmm. And what would happen is we had a cache of tires at every station. Mm-hmm. The boss would come out with a tire, a jack, hmm. a breaker bar, and a uh, what are they, lug wrench. And we yeah. have to do it ourselves. That was a part of the EVOC training that we had to learn how to change tires. If it was a rear tire, you know, they'd, they'd send, you know, some, someone else. I, I've never, I've had to change a couple front tires myself. Mm. But, you know, I've never had to change one of the rear tires. And I've got a great tire story for you all, if you want to hear. Oh, yeah. by all means. Oh, it's I, a good I would one. not trust me. I would not trust me. Change, I can change tires. I wouldn't trust me changing a steer tire in an ambulance. But no, that's okay. okay. When we finally got, you know, brought into the, uh, the happy family of the fire department that we all enjoy nowadays, um, okay. uh, you know, they have the tire trucks that come out and they're responding units that are out there. And so we had a flat on one of the dualies on the rear was the left side. I don't remember if it was the inner or the outer. I, I just don't okay. know. It doesn't impact the story in any way. Anyway, all right. so we went back to five, seven and uh, backed in the tire truck folks were there. They changed our tire and we were back in business. Right. So when we go out there and uh, we get our next job down by Cumberland. Now this is me and Ann, me and old Ann. Mm. Still miss this girl. So we're heading and we're booking down Flushing, heading towards the BQE because we got to go down towards Brooklyn Hospital and Cumberland and crap like that. Mm-hmm. So we're moving down Flushing, heading towards the BQE, and I feel a big thunk and the truck just like dips to the left. I'm like, what? Oh the hell is it? So I look at the mirror, and here comes one of my tires rolling by. <laughs> and here with the lug nuts, huh? Here comes the other <laughs> tire coming by. I'm like, oh, you lost two tires. Both of them on that side come rolling Ooh. by. So now I'm pulled over on, on Flushing and Marcy, chasing my right. tires down Flushing Avenue, you know, just to not to hurt nobody. No one else is going to run them over. Yeah. And I got my portable on me. I hear me. It's like, yeah, you, know, you might want to send someone out to give us a hand. My partner is <laughs> currently chasing our tires down Flushing Avenue. You know? <laughs> and then, you know, all radio discipline goes to the shit for like five minutes. Yeah. After that. So... <laughs> They come out and get us. Uh, uh, it took about an hour and a half for the tire truck to get back because immediately from us, he went out to the Bronx. He had to do another mm-hmm. run out there. So he gets up there and it's the same dude that did it originally. And exactly what you said before, Peter, is exactly what happened. The guy forgot to put the fucking lug nuts on the truck. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. I don't know if the F-bombs are right. No, no, no. That's fine. <laughs> but uh, he forgot to put and And uh, so Chief Robert H., came and joined us on scene and uh the dressing down he gave this poor guy driving the tire truck yeah unfathomable unfathomable deserved but unfathomable and thank uh, god it didn't happen where it did and it didn't happen on the bqe without excessive speed really could have killed somebody or yeah. us. two tires man two yeah. one i've heard of one Christ. Both, oh. both of the dualies came off this both of them you know it's like epic the, when we were driving down the street the tires mm-hmm just rode the treads of the lug bolts and came right off and started rolling away from us. It's wild. It was, was it your I new mean, truck or your old, was it a new truck yeah. or an old truck? This was a relatively, it was a relatively well, did it have new your, truck. I want to say, I mean, it have was a good stretcher in it. Um, <laughs> by that time. Yeah. I think we had a pretty decent, we didn't have a power stretcher. Okay. I think we had a one and yeah. a half yeah, by that time mm. at the very least. Yeah. Yeah. But, but thankfully, at least, you know, two or three years into my, you know, career as being a medic, started getting some of those, uh, at least the one yeah. and a half. Things in. And I've yeah. never known anything other than that. Yeah. I've seen some yeah. of the volunteers while I was there. 
that had the the battery ones. You know, I, I was always yeah. jealous. We got those guys from uh, from the hospital. That, yeah, yeah, that have them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and those are the senior units. They got right? them. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, Maymo, my mom and he's had them too. Maymo has the best of everything. These guys. Yeah. That's very rich hospital they got a lot of fancy yeah. toys yeah yep. a lot of fancy toys yeah they do no helicopters though you got to get helicopters you're not fancy i know right you have helicopters <laughs> where are you gonna land mm-hmm. it i would love one of know. them who cares you, you got a helicopter do you need to worry about it <laughs> I'm, I'm, a helicopter. I'm waiting to see you know i'm gonna get a little star trek in let's just beam in and beam out I know. I know. I'm, you know what? This could be amazing. You know, like if we live that long, oh, yeah. you know, to see it, like what's going to happen? Yep. You know? They're going to be like, yo, wait a minute. You actually lifted people up into the back of an ambulance? <laughs> yeah. With our bare hands. And you got blood on you with your bare hands? Like It, it was, mm-hmm. dude, it was a badge of honor back then. You know, we had people, you guys see bringing out the dead. Of course, you have to have yeah. someone. Mm-hmm. You know, Nick Cage is running around at the end of the day. I mean, he's just covered with blood and crap like yeah. that. I had medics at my station like that that ran like that all day back in the day. I was not one of them. Yeah. <laughs> if I got if I got jizzed up, I would just you know I always had a couple extra shirts in the locker. I just I did not. I was just kind of. I don't like that either. I get creeped. I like go back immediately. Mm-hmm. Like I gotta get changed because I get like especially if it's on like your sleeves. If you're wearing your jacket, I get like mm-hmm. super disgusted. You I know. know. You know, we only got one jacket, so of course yeah. we're hiding the hell out of that one and. <laughs> We got to do yeah. that until we can get it walk. So, what were your favorite kind of jobs when you were BLS? Um, any good jobs? I, I, I got to be honest with you. My favorite kind of jobs were uh, were the ones that I learned something out of. You know, if I was backing up ALS, or if I needed to call ALS because oh shit, I'm stumped. You know, yeah. yeah. And I do very entertaining ones like that over the years. Hmm. So uh, this one day, I had a call for Gary. Okay. Me and my old partner, Bobby Phelps, who wound up being a dispatcher, which was so ironic because this guy had the worst radio etiquette in the world. <laughs> we didn't have unit identifiers in the portables back then, so you can get away Could with it. Could you imagine? Yeah. You, could, you could talk whatever kind of shit on that radio you wanted to, but nobody knew who it was unless they recognized your voice. Yeah. Yeah. So this one day, me and Bobby, we get to this job. Rent's due. The landlord's going to collect the rent. And, you know, he knocks on the door. He knows the guy's in there because the TV's blaring. Yeah. The door's locked. So he kind of pushes his way in. And here's this guy just, you know, slumped over in front of his bed with the TV on. He calls us. We get there. We had to push ourselves in a little bit more because the guy didn't want to really make an entry to the apartment until, you know, someone of authority got there. Yeah. When we got there. I kind of stuck my melon in around the door. And, and here's this guy just naked from the waist down, leaning up against his bed and what's glaring on the TV, but hardcore porn. Oh man. Hardcore porn. So I'm looking around the house and obviously this guy was in the state of entertaining himself to some degree. And uh, apparently in the process of which he expelled the last amount of glucose from his body because we found some medications indicating he was type two diabetic. So this guy went hypovolemic while watching porn and taking care of business. Wow. Oh, so he's completely true. unconscious. We can't do a thing about it. You know, back is BLS. You can only give that glucose or oral meds if they're conscious and able to yep. self-administer. You know, yep. so not only could we not do that, we were also kind of glad we could do that because we could share this very <laughs> singular experience with a couple of our comrades. Yeah. You should. Those things you can't, you definitely should. So. I know we would have been so pissed if we didn't, you know. So <laughs> yeah. Gary and uh, and Captain Steve, who is as he is now, and they're like, "What in the hell is going on in here?" And I'm like, "Well, apparently he lost his last amount of sugar." And they're like, "Gotcha." Start the IV on the guy. The poor guy wakes up. I can't tell you how embarrassed this poor asshole was when he woke God. up. He quickly yo. Re- Realize what was happening. Looks down at himself. He's like, "Oh crap! Oh crap! Oh my god! I'm so embarrassed. I, I can't leave this apartment ever again." I'm like, "No, you're gonna be all right, dude. It's all right. It's all right." But you know, did you leave the TV loud when he woke up? <laughs> oh, that was blasted, and we left it going. Oh it was god. good content, man. <laughs> god damn. 
Yo, know, these are the kind of, you know, like, I wish we had body cams for some of this stuff. And then other things, like, I don't want a body cam. I know. You know? People don't believe half of the crap we tell them. No, like, they wouldn't. It's it's true. I mean, I mean, you see some of the weirdest crap, what people can do to themselves and do to each other out yeah. there. You know, it's just, it's it is really- fascinating. And, and, you know, thank God that, you know, I mean, there's no way you can do a job like this for the amount of time that we do yeah. this career out of it if you can't take some joy and entertainment as well as fulfillment, of course. That's the top one out mm-hmm. of this. You know, that's the biggest take yeah. But if it sucks to come to work and you, it's not fun anymore, why do you want to yeah. be there? And I'm No, you, ha- you have to be entertained. Over 30 years, I have been entertained and there's still... Every week, I have seen something I have never seen before, and something that just yep. kind of makes the holy crap, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Those which are plans. That, yeah, that's it. Like people will say, like, Joe, you haven't seen. I've never seen anything, and like, you know, like I'll work with other people that aren't Julianne, and I'm like, go, this surprises you? I'm like, and you're saying something? Like, yes. Like, I cannot believe that I'm seeing the things and the sights that I'm seeing sometimes. And well, we had yeah. a job not too long ago. Like we went on a job where it was in a men's shelter and the one guy called for his husband. And then when we got up there. Oh husband, my God, this is a great story. It was bizarre. Oh, was, and we're walking I, outside for a small guys. Keep going. Yeah. Okay. It was bizarre because like he, he calls us and he tells us, oh, my husband has heart failure. And when his heart rate gets below 40, he goes into a coma. And when we walk in, his husband is sitting on the bed with a nasal cannula in attached to but, a nebulizer. A nebulizer. <laughs> so it's like just blowing, but it's an end, it's an end title capnography well, one too. So it's like blowing. EMS- Oh. left it there you know some ems crew left it there so whoever listens to this don't leave props at people's houses yes so we're like don't okay you know like let's turn that off so we can hear what's going on and i'm thinking and then he says oh my husband also has seizures and the guy's looking very confused he's looking all around the place so i'm thinking okay he's post tictal so i'm like mm-hmm. um did he have a seizure tonight and he's like yes he has seizures i'm like okay so I, we do all the vitals all the vitals are good everything looks good but i'm still like not understanding why there's something is. weird it's just like this guy's just acting super weird until finally the husband decides all right we're going to help him get him on the chair and then the guy starts talking in this really put on baby voice where he's like so like the two year old's like daddy please, please. <laughs> I want shoes and I'm like what the funk and like Pete turns to me and he goes is this for real and I'm like shh I'm like trying to like get him to shush and he's like no 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 is this like a joke and I'm like shh like stop you know because I'm like I don't know what the hell this is Dude, they can probably we- hear us and I'm like yo I don't care at this point like this can't be real weird. And then the guy takes his husband and like lifts him up like as if he's crossing the threshold with him and puts him on But then he's bed. like wait he needs to bring his blanket. So then he puts him back on the bed and he takes his blanket that was piled in the corner and puts him on our chair on top of this blanket and then covers him with the blanket and helps us buckle him. Julianne, continue. So then after <laughs> all of this, he basically shows me a, a tube because I had asked him I thought, medicines. He's like, I, I, oh, I don't know the name. Now of I'm the looking like, time. what is she, what's so he, he doing with this tube? This ointment Are tube you- and whispers to me, um, he has bed bugs. And I'm like, Cool. You should have said that first thing when we came in here. It's That'd be a good thing to lead off with. Yeah, we've been here for 20 minutes. So like now I'm like that. Yo, these fuckers hit good too. They hit really good. Yeah. We had no when idea. I, when we started. So like, you know what? We haven't touched him. So go ahead. Well, continue. I touched him with my gloves for checking his, his vitals. But now we can see that he's crawling with them. So no, we no, no, no. We waited till we got in the elevator. This oh yeah the elevator. In the elevator we can see that he's crawling. she didn't see it and <laughs> she's like turned around this way and i'm like and i'm like hello oh, and yeah so when we get downstairs i tell the security guard the deal and basically the guy's like trying to pack a suitcase and a bat and like a blanket and i'm like he's not we're not taking any of that stuff that's not coming with us i'm sorry it's not coming with us and then the security guard's like take that shit outside and throw it in the garbage like you're not bringing that back upstairs so he made the guys throw their stuff out and because of COVID, mm-hmm. they were going to a hospital that won't accept like a family member with them. So we told right. them, we can't take you to the hospital. I mean, you can try to meet him there, but they're not going to let you in. And we take him to the hospital. And the whole time we're going to the hospital. That they wanted to go to. That he wanted to go to. Go to it was further away from where he lived. He was like, 
I, I, this is my birthday. And he's like showing me on his phone and he has headphones on. He looks like my kid, but my kid, like, I don't want him to hear something. And he's got big ass headphones on looking at his phone. And basically I'm like, is this, does this person have like an intellectual disability or is this just like a game? Like I couldn't figure it out. They and got some we, playing going on as well, yeah. right? And we got to- It was hospital. weird. And then he left. He like, he left before he even got triaged. And I was like, what the hell was this? Like- And he had no jacket on. Yeah. No it was, jacket. It was like 45 degrees. So, you know, Ice. see some bizarre <laughs> shit where you're like, like that's the first time in my whatever 18, 19 year EMS career that I was like, I'm not sure if this is even like a call or are we just a cab ride because these guys want to leave. The- or is this like a setup? Is this like a bitch job? I know. Like- I just, I <laughs> it was just, it was, yo, it was just too perfect. I, yeah. yeah. I literally like the nurse when we got there, she's like, what is this? I'm like, I don't know. It beats me. Like, I don't know what this is, you know, luckily I'm friendly with her. So it's not like, you know, but I'm just like, yeah, I don't know what this is. I don't even know if this is like an EMS job. I don't know what the hell this is. Like, mm-hmm. so you know, but he left. Do you remember those calls when you go? That's a white cough. 58. 58. Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. Do you, have you had those calls where you walk in and you're just like, are you, you're like, you're there and you have like a sick patient, but it's just like, you don't know what you're looking at. And you're like, I, I just don't know where to start. Yeah. You like, know, there's, there's been some interesting ones where, I mean, you know, where the whole family dynamic is just so damn weird, you know, yeah. that you're, and you're supposed to pay attention to the patient, but this is just like, <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I, I had to take one guy in one day. I mean, this was so weird. It bugged me out so much. We had a, a uh, this fella, he was uh, pretty much paraplegic. He had a, uh, uh, he had a Texas catheter that he wear all the time and um, okay. he couldn't really move. And he had, he had a lot, he had bad bed sores. He had bad bed sores on the back of his heels, as well as bad bed sores on his butt, his back, you know, when mm. it's free. and they were starting to get infected and uh, um, some, uh, maggots had uh, migrated to uh, try to clean out those wounds well that's lovely of them that was pretty <laughs> freaky you know that they waited for that point for us to take this guy out of the house mm-hmm. and so uh they had did you see him before you moved him or no um we didn't see him we didn't see the maggots until we were getting ready to to to, to package and and get Yo, going fucking hide why did I, you I mean, hide like that tell me about that first you know why yeah, we pulled the blankets down just in time for them to reinstall this guy's Texas catheter, which was pretty weird itself. And wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Mm-hmm. The maggots put it back on? No, the maggots, the family. Mm-hmm. Like his oh, oh. Catheter back on. I was like, wait, and the maggots was called it pretty the strange, you know? And, you know, you know, she cleaned him nice and she blew it dry. What? Which I was like, holy wait. crap, this is weird. Wait. You know? <laughs> I mean, literally, <laughs> like, Cleaned it and blew it dry, put the Texas cat there back on. And at the same time, there's a chicken hopping through the bedroom. What the hell? You know. <laughs> Sounds like a dream. It was like an acted flashback. There's a chicken hopping through the bedroom because the neighbors did cockfighting. They had a cockfighting illegal ring going on downstairs. Hi. And there were chickens just hopping through the whole damn house. And there's a chicken. I mean, me and me and my buddy Bob were just looking at each other like, I mean, could this shit just get me fucking weird? And now here's a damn chicken hopping through the damn bedroom. Yo. And it was just ridiculous. But uh, <laughs> oh end of the day, we wound up, we wrapped up the guy real good and uh, carried him downstairs. That was a scoop job. We had to scoop him down the wow. stairs. And, uh, and again, there was no backup. We had no backup back then. This was yeah. before the days of the fire department. And, uh, you know, we only had like, you know, two ALS units coming out of our area and, and, and yeah. we had no trucks and it was just so busy. We, we had nobody to help us out. So we had to hump this guy down yeah. three flights of stairs on a scoop stretcher, wow. navigating chickens on the way down to the truck. <laughs> it was just, I mean, it was so surreal, man. Awesome. It, really was. it was yeah. great. It was, it was entertaining, you know, and that's the part that keeps the job juicy for you, you know, yes. because you never know what yeah. the hell you see. You never know what, yeah. what the is going to be happening on that next call that's yeah. true and it's the, yo like that's yo I, that's why i love brooklyn like yo you don't know where people live you yep. know you don't know what's going to happen you never, the unknown exactly and i i like that i feel like i think that's why i've kept this job for so long because i have adhd and i'm like every day is different you know what i mean like besides your ambulance check in the beginning of the day pretty much that's the only thing that stays the same everything else from that point on is, is an unknown mystery 
Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, like, yep. let's face it, what are the kind of jobs can you work on this planet where you, you, you're, you're going to have that that unknown factor that's just going to keep you so intrigued and going to mm-hmm. keep wanting to do it over so many years, you know? It's, yep. Yeah. I, I've loved yep. it. Yeah. That's the funniest thing is like the ambulance, I don't know, like firemen, you know, they get, and a lot of them even say, I don't want a lot of them, the few that I talk to that are from other cities say that a lot of their good stories come from EMS runs, yeah. you know? So, yeah, well, I mean, a lot of good shit. Fires are boring. Put the wet stuff on the red stuff. You're done, you know? You're yeah, fires stuff. are good for like, you know, the first 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> All the fires then, showing. Yeah, you know, once all right, fires down, you know, that's it. But, but, but our whole thing, what you think, circus, you know? Yep, it is. It's exactly mm-hmm. it's a three ring circus. Exactly. Yeah. It's okay. I mean, it's okay. That job that you had with us that night, that was like one of those like, you know, weirdo, like what the hell is this? Like BLS, I think called for an AMS and it was like a guy who had a head injury, but he was also extremely drunk. And then when we show up, there's like two BLS, the, oh, the, the bunch of, a bunch of Orthodox Jewish guys and like yeah, oh, yeah. Shamrim, Orthodox yeah. cops. That was like and, East Midwood or something that came out. And yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. And it was like, and then the guy, wait, where, wait, hold on, hold on. Where's East Midwood? Well, we were in like Crown Heights, kind of like Is that down East Midwood. I no, thought East Midwood was East Midwood or East Flatbush or something like that. They're all oh, they're all pretty close to each other. I just spilled yeah. my beverage. I'm gonna grab a paper towel. I'll be right back. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know. I always see those guys around. I don't. I don't know where. I I know where Midwood Ambulance is. I don't know where East Midwood is. But it's it's. I think like, it's over like Brighton. Well, it's like yeah, in we, the more a lot of those with East Midwood. These guys were very buffy. You know they uh. Oh, they are. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, they all got scanners on them, you know. They listen to our crap, you know. If they hear something cool's coming mm-hmm. around, you know, they'll, they'll go buff it and try to get out there. And which, yeah. hey, I don't blame it, you know, because they're, they're crap. Probably. I don't blame them, except you know, I mean, I'm stealing your blood anyway. But you know, when you they come imagine, to my neighborhood, you got to imagine their stuff gets pretty monotonous, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. East Midwood was was more of. Uh, they were mostly, you know along the hot solar lines as, as far as ethnicity and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, they weren't just specifically serving the community. They were actually volunteering, you know, through the 911 system as well. So, you know, they like to get out there and, and see and do their thing and, and, and experience yeah. as much as they could. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, those guys popped up all the time on me out there. No, I was amazed. Like some of the places that I've seen them and I'm like, yo, where the fuck? It's like, how did you guys get over here? And you beat me? And this is my neighborhood. I'm always dazzled. So well, they, they pulled a clutch when they showed up with a stretcher in a, in Williamsburg when we had no ambulances. <laughs> and they showed up for like, hey, you're here. You got a stretcher. So and once in a while, they turn out, you know, and they, they could be an asset. You know, they really can. Yep. I yeah. remember yep. I, had, uh, I had Nancy hand carrying a lady who was stabbed with a tourniquet up the block to oh. their stretcher. Nice. Uh-huh. Yep. Me and Ann yeah. had a one day in uh, in Williamsburg, literally, it was right around the corner from where uh, Five Seven Will used to sit. Their official eighty nine was uh, was Bedford and Myrtle, but we used to hang out on uh, on like Bedford and Wallabout, which was one block north okay. of Flushing. Yeah. Yep. There were a couple of factory buildings, textile shops around there. Yeah, there's like that good little turnoff right there. And that's yeah, that's where we used to chill. It was nice and quiet, not a lot of traffic. We had some good napping times when, you know, naps were available back in the day. Mm-hmm. So we get a call to back up Hot Solo. And uh, we pull up on the scene. And, and we were, it was very close. We were, like, literally about two minutes out. It was uh, uh, south side Williamsburg. We were literally three okay. minutes away. So we show up over there. Hot Solo didn't have any medics to speak of that day. And as soon as me and Ann pull up, you come, and, and, you know, those guys travel like it's a... Uh, a clown car, you know, they got like six guys in their truck, right? Yeah. They got the van type. So you can imagine it's pretty cramped quarters when you're in the back of a van type bus, but they come out with this old fella, this old fella in his, in his, his mid to upper eighties. And this guy's in pulmonary edema and it is just literally rolling out of his, rolling over his upper lip, his lower lip. His, yeah. his, he is just weeping edema all over his body. His lungs are full. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, there are a couple of quirks when you work with hot solo, especially if you have uh, a female partner. Yes. That can get a little bit interesting at times. 
mm-hmm. you know, they believe that, you know, a, a, a male cannot be touched by another female if, unless it's not his wife, you know, that doesn't happen. And uh, the fellow that was with us from Hot Solo that day, he was very instrumental in us actually getting to treat this patient correctly and do what we had to do. So we load the guy into the back of the hot solar truck. Of course, we would have loved to bigger than ours because ours is like Cadillac compared to the little Pinto yeah. that we get shoved in the back of with eight other guys. And so me and Ann are doing our work and we are literally, um, my pelvis is right in her ass. It is so cramped in there. And that's how tight I'm right behind her getting ready for the IV, all of this other stuff. The patient's family member, they sit her in the front of the truck. She turns around and sees that my partner is a female and says something in Yiddish and you can see the emotion. I know she was upset about it, but yeah. I get no translation for female medic. She says female medic. So the guy for our benefit says back to her in English, hey, these are the two best medics in the neighborhood. You want the old man to live? Drop your shit and let them do what they got to do. Wow. So that's what we did. You know, we got the line started. We gave the EMS 80 of, uh, of Lasix. Oh, yes. Okay. Our nitro was on the guy, got him down to Hospital 95, and uh, this fella goes up to the lady, you know, and, and, you know, we didn't have time to gather a great history on scene. It was that desperate. Yep. We were like literally yeah. two minutes away from tubing this fella if we didn't get diuretics on board and start treating him with nitrates. Yep. So we just had to do it. We dropped him off in a better place. Then we left him. He thankfully diaries all over hot solar stretcher and not ours. Oh, nice. Good. Anytime mm-hmm. I got to spend less with the mop, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> we get him down there, and 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 the uh, and the hot solar fellow, that's the, the crew chief, says, he says, "How long has your dad been like this?" He's like, "Oh, two days." He's like, two days." He's been short of breath for two days, and he just call us now. And he says, "If you really wanted to kill your dad, why didn't you just bring him up to the fucking roof and throw him off?" Wow. And I'm like, "Damn, I wish I could say crap like that to some of my patients." Yeah, you can't. I know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, they got the inside mm-hmm. scoop over there. They said this to the guy. Yeah. It's like, damn, you know what, son? I wish I was you right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, That's wild. Yep. Yeah. They got a dope bracket. They have, what they got we? a dope bracket. We know the yeah, one dude, He from he's from Assist and stuff. So he's on Assist. He's like the CEO of Assist or something. He's on like um, East Flatlands. Yeah. I just I never mm-hmm. understand when people like I get it not everybody's you know family member is like people have stubborn family members myself included who don't want you to call 911 right away or whatever but like I don't know how do you like there's so many times where I'm like how did you let it get this effing bad you know what I mean like how did you let your family member get to this point before you called you know like it's just so crazy and that's like such a a regular occurrence, you know, where you go in and you're like, holy shit, you should have called us like three days ago, you know? It really is. Case in point, you know I mean? It takes a while for maggots and flies to show up on your injury yeah. when you start to go gangrenous, you know? Jesus Christ. Maybe when it starts smelling bad, you give us a call. Oh, I don't know. wait for the British to show up. You know? Mm-hmm. That, that's just me. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Are we more evolved? Yep. I, think? I don't know. Yeah. I had a grandma, they were covering her with like t-shirts. It was like ripped t-shirts that they were using to like cover the wounds and stuff. And they had her in like the back bedroom. It's like, I don't know, like, let your family go. You know, if you can't handle it, you know. You got to get them some service. Them on. You got to get them some service because there's plenty of facilities available. If you need that hand, mm-hmm. they're there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But that's the other crazy thing. If you ask, there was one lady we just picked up and she said that she had been trying to get in the nursing home. But because she had worked for, um, she had worked previously, her insurance was too much. So she didn't qualify to get into nursing home. Yeah, so. she was, there was a woman who, she was like, a, she used to be a PCA or something, right? Or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm but, scared. What's going to happen to us? You know, <laughs> it's kind of a shame. You know, I mean, just, you, you kind of touched on something really interesting there is that you know, people that actually do work hard in a blue collar job or maybe even a lower white collar job and can't qualify to get that same kind of treatment that somebody with the red, white and blue gold card can. Yeah, yeah it's and crazy, we, man. We, we've worked a career for it. And, yeah. you know, other folks that have not have much more access than we do yeah. quite a good amount of the time. It's, it's yeah. crazy. Yep. So I don't well, know. that we take to the hospital 
literally on a daily basis who <laughs> will never have a bill come to them. And then if I take an ambulance, I'm paying about $1,800 or something as a deductible or whatever, you know? Yeah, because we got, we got insurance. We work. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's certainly a, a, it's an uneven scale, to say the least. Yeah. I remember we had this one poor girl. She fell off a roof. Oh, and God. she had a broken femur. She's just worried about getting to work the next day. No, no man. Like, uh, like a, like a going to work. That's, I, she was no. lucky she was drunk, but yeah, she broke her femur after falling down three flights. Like Ooh. she's sitting on a, the fire escape and I yeah. guess they were drinking. Yeah. They were hit a, hit a, yeah, hit a roof and then went off. Yeah. Oh, not cool. Mm -hmm. No. But she was awake and she was just like, I have work in the morning. Like, do you think I'll be able to go? And we were like, um, I don't think so. You know, it's like, yeah, I can leave a message for your boss now. Like, I think you're going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, we'll give you a splint. We'll get you right back out there. That's so. it. Here's a band aid. So, a broken femur. Exactly. Work. Back <laughs> Fixes everything. So let me ask you about this. So we're going to go into your medic thing, but what was it like when it merged into HHC? And like, how did they tell you? that it was coming or, or was it like a surprise? Right. So, um, I mean, we were kind of surprised about it. And this I'm gonna say happened in 96. I was about four, four and a half years in just shortly before I went to medic school, I was actually in my last BLS refresher when this happened and it was a pretty emotional experience. Um, we knew that the fire department was taking over. Giuliani made a decree to uh, include us in the department as part of that other mayoral organization. Mm. Uh, and when it realistically hit home for us, when I was in that refresher, uh, back when we were wearing the green and white, you know, we used to wear, we used to wear badges on our uniforms. And uh, the captain of the academy at that time, who did wind up to become a chief. And again, this is a long time ago. I, I remember her face and her attitude distinctly, mm -hmm. but I just can't remember her name. But the impression left upon me is she came into this room crying mm -hmm. and ordered us all because the, the order was just cut mm -hmm. that EMS personnel we were still wearing green and white at that point because they haven't figured out what they're going to do with us as far as uniforms yet. But they're like, our guys don't wear badges. Therefore, you guys are not going to wear badges. And we were ordered mm -hmm. to take our badges off at that point. And, you know, she told us in no uncertain terms that this is not optional. This is the way it is. And she took her badge off in front of all of us. Wow. At that point, again, she was pretty up there. She was the captain running the academy, running that shift on tour three where we were. Yeah. And we had to follow suit and, and take our badges off and put them in the pockets. And, you know, they didn't ask us to collect them, but we just, hmm. from that moment on, we could no longer wear that. Hmm. And the growing pains, I think, were, if I'm going to be completely honest, were, were, were harder for the, for the fire suppression folks because they, at that point, were a lot more old-fashioned than we were. You know, that's uh, that's a club that predates us by over a hundred years. Yeah. You know, celebrated their uh, their hundred years about maybe eight or ten years ago when we celebrated our fiftieth yeah. anniversary, and then came the yeah. whole combined uh, campaign of two hundred years of saving lives together. You know, that was our fifty yeah. plus their one hundred fifty. Yeah. But a lot of these old timers. In, on the fire side had a very hard time when we were integrated. Their EMS runs became a lot more numerous. They started CFR at about the same time. So these guys came out and they were backing us up on a lot more jobs and they weren't really happy about the extra time being spent out on the street and doing EMS runs, which you know they felt kept their time more unavailable to respond to a fire if, if, a, if a box happened to drop in a neighborhood and they weren't really, you know, too cool with that. Um, the officers, you know, they had an answer to a higher authority and, and they're always held to that, you know, higher standard of, uh, of coolness, if for lack of another word, that's what I'll call it. Yeah. 
Yeah. But you know, they tried to keep their guys cool. But you know, we received a lot of comments, a lot of off hand, a lot of offhand remarks back in the day. Like when we did get into the uniform and they gave us that fire mm -hmm. department patch. You know, a lot of these guys had a lot of animosity towards it. Like, you know, I had to work my ass off for that patch, and here they just freaking handed it to you. And wow. you know, we were left in that position. And again, you know, we didn't have boss coming to jobs all the time back then. You know, yeah. boss. The only time bosses came out were like for MCIs or if they felt like it back then. Mm -hmm. You know, we have bosses that in the matrix now, we have to go to, you know, priority ones and priority twos automatically. A boss is going to be there. MCIs automatically, a boss is going to be there. It wasn't like that back in the day. Okay. I ran MCIs back in the day as a, as a freaking medic before, you know, that matrix change happened. I was the one mm -hmm. giving 12s at fires before bosses were assigned to fires and crap like that, you know, and that's the way it go. You know, the first high medical authority gets to the scene. I was running fires. I was running yeah. MCIs. Now that's just the way it was. But um, thankfully, you know, the elder guys, the officers that had a little more maturity, a little more experience, you know, they were able to keep their guys calm. Yeah. There were a couple of times where I, I really felt uncomfortable being on scene with these fellas. Mm. But yeah. after a while, you know, once the growing pains kind of settled in and also the brutal reality which a lot of these guys didn't see at that time was that CFR kept the hell of a lot of firehouses open. Yeah. Hell of a lot of firehouses open for a while. Quite a bit of them lost the fifth man and they were running the four guy trucks. Yeah, they all came back. Yeah. CFR changed that. They were all five guy trucks again. <clears throat> firehouses didn't close nearly as much and CFR actually kept a lot of these guys from getting downsized mm -hmm. and closed. And I think at some point, you know, they finally came to the realization to see that, but you know, right, hey, maybe this integration really, really isn't so bad. And, you know, there is a lot we can learn from each other. And the culmination of that, in my mind, is when we finally, finally started doing joint training ventures mm -hmm. with fire suppression, EMS, and also with PD. That was a milestone that yeah. just started making everything gravy. Yeah. It really made me happy. And I'm so glad that I, that I had a major part in that back in the day. And I'm referring to exclusively is uh, when we started the Counterterrorism Rescue Task Force. Yeah. Is when. So you've seen it from both sides. You know, so I have. You were there in the beginning. You know, like when you started, you couldn't even go. On. Imagine if you went to the rock. You know, in I the late nineties, I wouldn't be welcome there. I wouldn't be welcome. Imagine there. If you had a classroom there. Like that's just wild. You oh, know? it was nuts. Uh, we had oh. one day that I that I spent in the rock, but you know, right when you know the merge was just starting to settle in, they had us meet because it was a good deployment point. When when my when met basic one when we were in class, um, yeah, they uh, they put us all out. And this, we all went as a class uh, and we worked at the New York City Marathon. Okay. This was all right at about the time that we were, you know, we were going IV classes, you know, stuff like that, doing phlebotomy, blood drawing, learning vene puncture. And yeah. what better place to learn how to do large bore IV administration than with a whole bunch of freaking scarecrow looking athletes with veins the size of the Texas pipeline, you know? How'd that go? Sent us. That went fantastic. So we showed up at the Rock and put us all on buses, sent us out. Most of us worked at the tent at the finish line. We had a couple mm -hmm. other people that were sent out with uh, with crews in, in Cushman's at the time because we didn't have uh, those cool. We didn't have the Gators. Yeah, the Gators. Oh wait, the Cushman's were the three wheeled things, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah oh. cool. mm. And I did get to ride one of them. <laughs> That's that pretty cool. Fun. That was a good time. But the gators were a freaking pisser. But but I again, gator. that was the first time we all deployed from the same place, you know, because they brought a lot of okay. CFR. To, but the CFR was was still in its, its very infancy when I was in medication. Yeah. But we sent a lot of them out there with us, you know, and we basically, okay. you know, they were used as the muscle, you know, yeah. helping transporting people that, you know, flop down and, and, and get them to one of the treatment tents and stuff like that. Hmm. But again, we didn't start really having a major understanding until I'm going to say like, you know, six, seven years before the end of my career when we started that uh, 
that new it's changed plan. like since you know yeah. even since i came on it's it's gotten a lot different you know and it might be because you know i know a lot of the guys that are you know that are firefighters now but mm -hmm. you know and you don't know who's a the worst thing is like you know you don't know who's a medic and who's a fireman and stuff anymore so no you know you know i mean i've been surprised mm -hmm. very many times that you know I, I've had days that I've been out there and I was working with a complete shithead. You know, somebody doesn't know his ass from his elbow. It happens. You know, you get some, you get some boob coming with you for overtime or some yeah. fresh grit at the academy that really has no idea what goes on in the street. Yeah. And here you got a shitty call. You got a guy that's circling a drain. And, you know, I had, a, I had firefighters on several occasions realize that, you know, I'm not working with the optimum partner at this moment. And, you know, I got a firefighter that, that, opens up my bag, takes that tube kit, mm -hmm. stuffs the sticky thing mm -hmm. into a 7.5, hands me the laryngoscope. scope. He says, what size you want? Mac 3, give it to me. And he set me all up, syringe on it, the whole mm -hmm. thing, holding it as we're taping it. I'm yeah. like, I had a little experience in this near He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a medic before mm -hmm. I got pulled over the fire. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been grateful for that kind of crap because, you know, most yeah. of those guys kind of don't forget where they come from. Yeah. I wish and they wouldn't. I wish they would help us more, you know? Thankfully, now a majority of the people in fire suppression have came from our ranks. Oh yeah, so they know what's going on, and and thankfully they kind of remember, you know, like hey, you know, we're not we're not we're not the redheaded stepchildren that you all think we are, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, we were a step mm -hmm. going for you. I hate the word promotion to firefighter. That's a career change mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. That's not a promotion. That's a career change. God bless you for doing it. Yeah, these guys they make more mm -hmm. money what they want to do sure you know it's a I mean, different it's a whole different job you know if you job. Yeah. but you know yep. just don't forget that hey you know you know you you came from yeah. here it was your foundation and your entrance into that world mm -hmm. you know sometimes you have like definitely great experiences and sometimes you have terrible ones and like I don't know. I mean, we had one during COVID, like at the height of COVID, you know, they were pulling us everywhere and we went mm -hmm. to Howard beach, like of all freaking places. Like, mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And the patient was really sick. Like it, it looked like maybe she'd had a stroke or something, but she was like completely unresponsive, like really messed up. And not only had they done everything, like they'd gotten vitals for us mm -hmm. like blood pressure and everything. Um, they stayed with us and like rode it in with us. And we were and like, they drove us. Yeah. We were like, there's no way. We and, were like, and, and, you guys no. were EMS? Yes. And a few of them were like, yeah, we were EMS and they were so, and we were up. working. We we're like, we we're doing a tube and everything. Guys, you want me to do the 12 weight? I'm like, what? Yeah. So it was, and it was great. like, such a, like for us, it was, I mean, they took us to the hospital, you know, like it was astounding. There was no question. There was no Yo, question about it. Like, yeah. I've had and very, very similar experiences too. You know, if you get the right bunch of them, you know, some of them can't wait to hear the words, all right, you're up. Right. Yeah. Because let's face it, that's mm -hmm. what they want to hear. They want to get out. They want to go 98 and we get it back in the mix. Yeah. But, you know, yep. I've had many over the years that are like, hey, what do you need? We're here for you. Whatever, whatever the hell you need. Yep. Yeah. I'll give you an example. I, uh, I used to do a lot of overtime in Staten Island. I love my Brooklyn, don't get me wrong, but I live right in between 22 and 23. I live right in between. And if I'm going to do overtime, I'd like to go close to home. Mm -hmm. Maximize my buck. If I can save me a couple of dollars going over that damn eating gang plank a few times a week, mm -hmm. shit, sure, I'm going to do it. So I'm working conditions 2-1, which comes out of 22 at Willowbrook in Staten Island. And I get called down to the ferry mm. for a cardiac arrest. That's far. That is far. It's that's far. It was, that's, it was a good. That's like New Jersey. It was that's a like good New Jersey. Ten, it was a good ten minute hump to the ferry terminal from where I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I was working the conditioner's car, and um, so lo and behold, uh, a mother and son decide that they're gonna hey, let's do some heroin together on this city bus. Oh God. Right? So we get there and the son is completely unconscious, unresponsive. We knock in him, you know, all right, he's up. Mom, on the other hand, was in cardiac arrest. Shit. Wow. So we're doing CPR. I got one medic unit. I got one DLS. You know, I need to split my medics up and it would be nice if I can have an extra couple set of hands around, you know, because I'm dealing with a cardiac arrest and another yeah. patient. I transport two patients and I got two units and one is a cardiac arrest. Yeah. So I looked over to the uh, 
to the captain, to the fire captain, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to need one of you boys to drive a truck. I need all hands on deck. He's like, I'll give you two guys. You can put you can put everybody in the back of both of your trucks, man. I'll drive both of your trucks down to Tandem down, down mm-hmm. Hospital. I ain't got no problem with that. And, you know, more often than not, you know, I've got some token resistance. Yeah. Some fire officers over the years. But for the most part, you know, when I became an officer, if I told a fire guy I need his crew. Yeah, they're going to help you for the most part. 9.9 times out of 10. And yeah. like, yeah, they're going to give me that. Ah. But, but they do yeah. it. They do it. Yeah. We kicked, we kicked, the, we kicked the energy company loose on a cardiac arrest because we were all set to go. You know, mm-hmm. like we're just pumping, we're getting ready to go. And they had right. a structure that came in. So we're like, yo, get out of here. It's right there. Like, you know, we don't make you lose a first due job. You know, we're doing all the things. We're getting out of here. Sure. Well, it comes out, they got canceled. Yo, these guys came running back upstairs. We're like, get the fuck out of here. And we were like, that's, oh, back? that's rare. Yeah, they came back mm-hmm. to help us. They were like, you know, we figured we were canceled. We're going to come back and do the job, you know? I was like, wow. A couple mm-hmm. of times back in the early days when we were just getting integrated, you know, these guys would, uh, you know, they couldn't wait for EMS to pull up on the scene. And, you know, I'm not saying that our wonderful fire department, which is the best on the planet, would lollygag get into the scene. But if uh, EMS happened to pull up on the scene before the engine got there, you know, they would be more than happy to take that year up in 10-8, you know? Yeah. Happy to get mm-hmm. the hell out of Dodge. But as the years went by, and I, I, I really think, you know, joint training had a lot to do with uh, getting comradeship better with uh, with all these, you know. And again, I'm not just going to say two agencies. I'm going to say three agencies between us, suppression and PD. It really has mm-hmm. gotten better over the years. And uh, that damn joint training out on the rock. Yeah. Again, I would have got bounced out of the rock back, you know. But when I went up there as a counterterrorism instructor, I was on an equal footing with the guys from fire and the guys from ESU and the guys from SRG, because we were all teaching one common thing, you know, how to survive yeah. and mitigate the atmosphere of an active shooter, a bomber, crap like that. And that was just one of the most amazing and fulfilling parts of my career. I mean, as all the instructors, I mean, you know, we were all wearing blue, you know, yeah. Yeah. whether it be light blue or, 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 or dark blue, we were all wearing blue. We had a lot of shit hot instructors up there from all sides, great presenters, yeah. Uh, great lecturers and stuff like that. I did a, I did a handful of lectures for them, but most of my part was, you know, I did skills and, you know, I took okay. great action that uh, I fabricated my own mock IED back in the day. Hmm. And I got to blow fucking a hundred firefighters up on it every Saturday, you know, and it was a wonderful, <laughs> yeah. really damn cool, you know, but we all learned a lot together and there was a, a great fellowship that yes, I saw happen and evolve with the students you know, because yeah. a lot of the cops that we had up there, as well as the firemen and the EMS guys, they were all experiencing this for the first time. A lot of these SRG guys and the ESU folks we trained were literally there for their first day. And they were students, not instructors. And we mm-hmm. had instructors from all those three different facets there. Okay. It was fascinating to watch, you know, at the end of the day, seeing, seeing the fire guys and the cops high-fiving and crap like that, which we're normally yeah. seeing them fight over yeah pool on the scene of an accident you know that's what mm-hmm. we usually say. now on the thing i mean immediately we had a, a big gel thing and we, and we got along very very well and it got down to the point where when we were doing this both on randall's island they got a big ass kitchen up on that second floor that nobody knows about uh-huh. and we had a building hmm. at fort totten where they do a lot of the medic cmes that has a nice kitchen in the back you know that room right next to the ernie pile building Oh, that's the one. Uh... Right across from Quartermaster. Yes, yeah. Right Three Quartermaster, yeah. whatever it is. Right, yeah. Okay. And we had that full kitchen. We'd get out there, everybody chip in. We'd cook our meals together. We'd sit down together. We'd have fun together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this also kind of transcended out to when we had our deployments. Um, I was on the original, um, the uh, the borough task force, which was the which was the the first tier, and the division task okay. force, the kind of guys that were in the reserve. You know, if we needed to pull some other folks in, most of the okay. borough task force consisted of all instructors and founding members of the team, which thankfully I was one of them. Yeah. And I'll never forget, you know, one day, you know, we get a bunch of cops come in and, you know, we did most of our deployments from a firehouse because they have the spaces. If we're doing a standby somewhere, you know, 
we're on the apparatus floor. A lot of times they would yeah. surrender at their lounge to us and stuff, which is pretty mm. cool. But, you know, I'll never forget, you know, I, and I've seen this uh, at least a half a dozen times. These cops come down and said, whoever thought I'd be sitting down directly across from a firefighter in his house sharing a meal, you know, and these are the cops saying that because he, never would I thought of this at the beginning mm. of my career right. because it just never happened until we actually started having these joint training initiatives and stuff like that. And I feel it really kind of pulled the agents a little bit closer together. Mm. And that being a result, that, those were some of the best instructing times in my lives is when I did that. Yeah. You know, I met so many different people from both the fire suppression side and, and, and the cop side. It was, it was enlightening. Those some heavy hitters, man. Those are yeah. some big names you probably got to hang out with and stuff. Oh, absolutely. So, mm. you know, we, got, we got to meet yeah. a lot of folks. And the money was good. That was a lot of overtime. That was a great yeah. trip for a couple of years, man. I bet. And then COVID <laughs> screwed that all up, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's it, right? I, I probably, because I did one of those trainings up there at The Rock, and I really enjoyed it. Like, I genuinely yeah. felt like it was cool that we were all together. Right. And it was, like, really interesting to go through all this stuff together, through the buildings, like, what, you know, information and yeah. I genuinely liked it, um, but I haven't done it in a long time. And I felt like that was actually a really cool, like very enjoyable training, you know? It was, you know, we actually got into the planning stages of, we actually started executing some of day three. There was supposed to be five initial training days for that. And once COVID happened, you know, there's no way to, to really socially distance that class because again, yeah. you, you're, you're, you are shoulder to shoulder in that formation yeah yep mm -hmm. right on top of the guy in front of you going through that and and you know we just couldn't train like that anymore you know last couple of uh refreshers we've been to and see me is you know you got one guy with the six mm -hmm. feet gotta wear your mask and i don't know how much that's changed since i left yeah kind of relaxed have they relaxed on those procedures More relaxed. yeah did we I, mm -hmm. I feel like the last training i did we didn't it, wear we didn't wear masks we wear at, mask. at the academy <laughs> mm -hmm. so Mm -mm. Yeah. We have one guy. He wears like three masks, and he keeps getting COVID. Oh, so, our yeah, uh -huh. I think he's licking people. That's really what I think it is. I think he's licking them. So you know what? Mm -hmm. I think I know who that guy is too. I think you do. <laughs> more some uh -huh. more susceptible. I've had it a couple of times, but you know, he's I mean, had it more than anybody. Uh -huh. You know, I, I think he might be going over there and getting like you know, this the milk from the cow or something. This fellow works at your uh, station uh, now, doesn't he? He works at five seven now. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah he he's a little accident prone. He's so I love him. Oh yeah, he's he's, he's going to be a good medic. He's definitely oh, he's going to yeah. be he's going to be awesome. He's going to so. be fun, and and I mm -hmm. really hope so because uh, he is the progeny of the yeah. best partner I have ever had. Yeah, someone who was mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, she was oh. like a ALS backup for me when I was in Queens. Was when you were in Queens, yep. Wow, I, I can't believe I just pulled out of you. It, all you had to say was three masks, because I know he's, <laughs> he's, uh, yeah. he's that much of a yeah. uh, hydriac, but he's, uh, oh, he's, but he's a good well, He says he's a germaphobe. He says he's a germaphobe. So he's, he's probably, he's going to listen to this, and he's going to be smiling, because he's going to know who he is. I so, hope, you know, and, and he's going to be like, oh, fuck, you're talking about me. Yeah. And so does his mom. And I've known his mom yeah. since I first came on the job. Me and his mom have been friends. Uh, we used to live right across the street from each other in the same uh, apartment building complex that were owned by Trump's brother in Staten Island. <laughs> and uh, her yeah. and her lived there with us. And uh, and I'm just so happy. And when she finally became a boss, 38 was her first posting. Yeah. I'm like, okay. oh, my I'm getting my fucking girl back. I'm, I, I've missed this girl for so many years. You know, she was out there doing her own thing, one communications to, to get in the medic class and then getting a rescue and then, you know, finally becoming mm -hmm. a boss. And then to see her son, you know, come up and, and go through the ranks. I, I was really proud to see that, you mm -hmm. know, that he's yeah. following in footsteps. And uh, he's smart. And he's a little encouragement with a little, little encouragement yeah. from Uncle Frank, yeah. too, over the years, you know. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. He has, he has a lot of good people watching out for him. So, oh, yeah. you know. Absolutely. Bro, I was young. We were all young. You know what I mean? Yo, I was young and crazy. Like, if I came on here when I was 18, I would have got fired. So I was out of my mind. <laughs> I, I was out of my mind. <laughs> I was out of my mind when I was a kid and stuff. So. I hear you. It's been such wow. a great journey, though, man. You know? it, it, it is. It is. Yeah, yeah. I 
Oh, that's. I'm getting crap from my wife. Though. All right, you're retired. You know, to go out and do something, make some damn money. You know. Yeah. The way I'm yeah. looking at it, hell, man, I sold my heart and soul to this journey for 30 years. I think I can chill for a little while. You know. Yeah, yeah, you have to. You know. So, like, one of our friends, he left. He was in Detroit EMS for like 30 years, well, and he a, left. Yeah. And then, yo, yeah, we got to get all the old timers. Like, bro, their stories are wild, wild. The Detroit stories. Oh, we got to get like a you know, party with us in Detroit. In yes, I agree. Minutes. I think that would be um, really fun. I think it's going to be the next one that we're going to do. So because everybody keeps talking about this. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it could be pretty good. So, but yeah, you know, like, he had a hard time. He went back to the ambulance for a little bit. And, you know, he was fine. Like, yo, I can't do this anymore. So mm -hmm. yeah. maybe he'll stay retired now. So, right. He's got knee surgery. Oh, poor guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a matter of time before I start getting some bones and joints fixed on myself. It'll happen. <laughs> I think that's where we all kind of end up, you know? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. up. But, all right, right. so <laughs> Frank, we've been going for an hour and 40 minutes. <laughs> we have to wrap this up. We're going to have to do a part two of Frank. Because we didn't even touch your medic part. We got part of the medic. And then we still got to get to the training stuff. So. Oh, I love that. We can, we can have some good stuff then. I, I'd be more than happy to mm -hmm. get Exactly. It's been a yeah. great time. I had a good time with you guys. And so uh, you know, uh, our, yeah. our first meeting was certainly interesting, but <laughs> it was. It, it was well, totally not, getting better. not our first meeting, me and you, Julianne, but um, yeah. I mean, you know what? It's, it's fostered a lot of maturity and goodwill. And uh, this is a good thing. We should we should definitely, definitely do this again. Yeah. And oh, no, we're gonna. It's Sorry. been a blast, man. Mm -hmm. It really has. Yeah. I thank you guys for having definitely. me on so much. It's, it's really Thanks, Frank. All right. Cool. Well, we'll All right. the next uh, next time, you know. All yeah. right. Hang on one. Yeah, hang on one sec. Hang on.